Dr. Rupert Sheldrake is one of the world's most innovative biologists and is best known for his theory of morphic fields and morphic resonance, which leads to a vision of a living, developing universe with its own inherent memory. This morphogenetic field proves that the sages were right. We are all connected as one. His books, The Sense of Being Stared At and Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, detail his findings. Dr. Bruce Lipton is an internationally recognized authority on bridging science and spirit. He is the author of best-selling The Biology of Belief and teaches that when you realize that you are creating a specific field of energy around you according to the different thoughts and emotions you're experiencing, you are on the road to taking control of the things you find in your life. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to put your hands together and help me welcome Dr. Bruce Lipton and Dr. Rupert Sheldrake. Well, I figured I'd start this off because this is a conversation that's been about 17 years in the process of getting to. Uh, I have a letter here that I just showed Rupert that he wrote to me back in uh, May 1989. Uh, back then I didn't have to, to use this, so it's a little different today. And uh, I had sent uh, uh, Dr. Sheldrake a, a copy of a, pro, uh, um, a theory, thesis on, on liquid crystal consciousness. And I figured I have to send it to somebody who was thinking bigger than the people I was working with at Stanford at the time. They didn't even want to talk about this stuff. And so I was really absolutely delighted and surprised that actually he wrote back that he even read it. So I got real excited and saved this letter for 20 years now. <laughs> and he writes, uh, Dear Bruce Lipton, uh, Dickie, pass on to me a copy of your essay on liquid crystal consciousness, which I've, had, which I've read with much interest. That was um, so. I was, um, when I got your letter and when I read your stuff, uh, Bruce, I was very excited, in fact, because there are not many biologists who think outside the box. And it was a small number then, and I would say it's an even smaller number now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, absolutely, but uh, it, the, the company is wonderful, so I appreciate that very much. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, the way I saw it, really, was that having read some of your more recent things and... Um, looking at and seeing one or two of your presentations. Both of us started from biochemistry and molecular biology. Um, when I was working in developmental biology, I got very interested in the idea of organizing fields, morphogenetic fields, which organize living systems, as it were, from the top down. Um, you've made a really detailed and uh, um, thorough study of the molecular mechanisms and the nature of membranes quantum tunneling processes and so on. So your approach seems to me more from the bottom up, at least when you're dealing with cells. Well, it, for me it was a real exciting uh, part of my life because uh, as Rupert talked about, I came from the conventional world. I was teaching in, in a medical school, conventional story about how DNA controls life, the central dogma, the belief of our being genetic automatons. And uh, what got me really into this was that I was working on uh, cloning stem cells. And it's interesting because today we talk about stem cells, some hot new thing that just came out. And my first stem cell cultures were in 1967. And I was cloning these stem cells. And what that meant was I'd start with a single cell and then let it uh, isolate it and then let it divide and it would create a colony of several thousand cells, all genetically identical. And so what I found was something very, very similar is that if I took these cells and put in Petri dish A with conditions A, uh, they, they form muscle. But if I took the same genetic cells and put them in another petri dish with a different environment, they started to form bone. Or even a third dish with a different environment, they started to form fat cells. And, uh, and here I am in the middle of this whole uh, uh, world based on genetics as a controlling factor of life. And I realized, well, these are all genetically identical. The only thing that changed was the environment. 
and the environment controlled the cells. And that led me on a, on a track uh, to, to identify how could the environment influence what we thought was genetic control. And, and that led me to the understanding of the membrane as this interface. And, and it was fun because what I was really finding is that the membrane was an intelligent mechanism. It would read what was going on in the world around it and then send information into the cell to adjust the biology to meet the demands of the world. And so why that became important is I started to recognize, well, the information that controls the cells is not in the cell. The information that controls the cells is from the outside. And, and uh, then uh, morphogenic fields came into to my, my reading, and this was classic because of the uh, uh, pioneering effort to, uh, he got out of the box big time when he wrote this book uh, because I realized most of my colleagues weren't going to even talk about it either. And I got excited, that's why I sent my work to, to Rupert because I provided a mechanism by which the fields that uh, Rupert was suggesting existed, I she was showing a, me a mechanism to convert those fields into the molecules that make biology. So it was like, I didn't have to find the fields. He, he brought me the fields and I came with a membrane and it was like, perfect marriage at that point. Yes. Well, I too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet consummated, no. but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was. Uh, Actually, I didn't realize that you'd started on stem cells because when I was doing my PhD at Cambridge, I was working on tissue cultures, plant tissue cultures. And I had very much the same experience as you. The same cells, the same genetics, change the hormonal balance and the conditions in which they're growing. And you could change the destiny of these cells um, just by changing the chemical conditions. Um, Somehow the membranes and the cells were responsible. Well, when I started to, um, it was interesting, it was, uh, I was still stuck in the chemical world. And I identified uh, that on the membrane, there are these structures called receptors. And there's an interesting parallel here, which we'll talk about again maybe tomorrow, and that is that we are made in the image of a cell, actually. So that if I talk about a cell or I talk about a human, we're still talking about the same thing. So the skin of the cell is very much similar to yours in a sense. It's a boundary that contains the inside, but it also has the ability to read the environment. So as we have eyes and ears and nose and taste and all these other receptors, cells have on them the same things but in micro form in a sense. So they're reading the environment and the truth is, from my, actually my second grade image when I first saw cells, I saw them as, as sentient beings. I didn't see them as just moving around in the water. I saw them as people and it turns out to be, here's a very interesting uh, relation if you uh, that we talk about at some point in regard to fractals, that we are made in the image of the cell. Every function that is in our human body is already present in every cell. Anything you can identify in here is in a cell. It's got digestive, respiratory, excretory, nervous, reproductive system. Uh, every cell even got an immune system. And so the relevance that was really fun for me is that by understanding the nature of what the cells were reading in their environment, uh, it changed their lives. And, and then I started to recognize this because I'm cloning these cells in a petri dish. And, and the simple thing that you've learned right away in culturing cells is sometimes the environment isn't that good when you culture them and you, you put the cells into these cultures and the next thing you know they're sick and dying and they don't look very good. But I found if you take those cultures and then put them into a better environment, the cells immediately recover, grow, and start to flourish. And then all of a sudden it hit me and I said, oh my goodness, that realize this, that while we see ourselves as single individual entities, that's a misperception because the living things are cells. We are communities of cells. About 50 trillion cells has been suggested uh, making us up. Why, why that's relevant is that in a simple reality, we are like skin-covered Petri dishes. And <laughs> if we put our Petri dishes in a good environment, then we flourish and do well. And if we put it in a bad environment, we start to reflect what was going on in that environment and that we can come back and then get back into a good environment and recover. And why this became important is, for me, it took the emphasis to understand the nature of health and vitality was to look outside of the cell and not look inside the cell, which became, to me, a physical complement of the world. So the cell becomes a complement of its environment. And so then the issue is, what is that environment? And my conventional teaching only left me in the physical world of molecules and atoms and, and, and the material world. And uh, it was at some point after I left my conventional job that uh, I picked up a book by Heinz Pagels called The Cosmic Code. 
and it was about quantum physics. I had no idea about quantum physics, really, because as a biologist, I was just lucky enough to get through physics in school. And so, I, but it turned out that I realized that not only myself, but every one of my colleagues was only programmed with what is called Newtonian or you know, classical physics, which is a world based on material reality. That they didn't understand anything about quantum physics, neither did I, but as I started to read the book, I was totally shocked because the simple truth is this, physics is the primal science. If you want to study biology, you've got to know physics before you know biology. And I started to go back and I realized not only did I not know it, everyone in my field had no understanding of this physics. And the first thing the new physics said is, it's not the physical reality where the information is. It's in the field, the invisible stuff. And all of a sudden, it was like that jumped me uh, from my mechanical material world idea into entertaining the concept of the invisible force as being more powerful. And, then, and, and what it ultimately brought to me was the concept of spirituality, which I didn't believe in. And I, I actually got into science to avoid uh, the spiritual stuff. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because when you're growing up and you, and you hear these people give all this wonderful spiritual wisdom, and then as a kid you look at their lives, and even as a kid you go, geez, well, you know, that doesn't work for that guy very well, so why should you listen to that? Um, and so I really went into science because I thought that's where I'm going to find all these truths uh, to, to make sense out of my world. And, and the joke for me was, when I finally got to the awareness and I was already a tenured faculty member, I realized I was teaching religion uh, as much as I was teaching science. And that's because we were, we were just teaching dogmatic beliefs based on what everybody, you know, like a show of hands. How many people want to believe in this? Oh, that's enough people, so that's a rule. And uh, <laughs> so the issue about that is that um, I started to realize is that we were completely misunderstanding the nature of the game and that you cannot, you cannot live in this world without understanding first the mechanisms of the quantum mechanics, which is the foundation. And it's kind of weird because that's that weird science. You know, that's the one that's, it's a particle, it's a wave. How can it be both? And that's, that's the nature of the game. And yet, the moment you bring that science into this field of biology that we're talking about, all the problems that we're really basically facing in the world today start to sort themselves out in much better solutions and resolutions than the mechanical drug pharmaceutical industry answer to, to the issues. And, and it's an unfortunate situation because my perception of it now is that this has been perhaps one of the biggest destructive events in biomedicine is their collusion with pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I agree with you. I found that the surprising thing for me was that while in the 20th century physics had become more open, discovering more and more weird things, quantum theory, indeterminacy, um, you know, all the different wave particle duality, quantum non-locality, in cosmology, weird phenomena like quasars, now multiple universes, uh, all this stuff was going on. Physics getting broader and broader and stranger and stranger. In the same period, throughout the 20th century, biology has gone in exactly the opposite direction. It started broad, and it's got narrower and narrower and narrower, right through the 20th century. As when I was an undergraduate, most biology was still semi-holistic. We still looked at living animals and plants. Not much, but I mean, the first thing you, <laughs> you brought them into the lab, and they were alive for the first few minutes till you killed them. <laughs>